Hey, Feel Good Fathers, thanks for tuning in. I'm here with my man, Joe, former rocket scientist, keynote speaker, tons of stuff. Uh, can't wait to hear more. All right, what is up, Jay? Hey, uh, so before we get started, we have this tradition here. What's your best dad joke? All right, well, I'm sure you can see the guitar hanging behind me. Um, this should be a former rocket scientist, musician, you know, rocker. <laughs> so has to deal with music. And, you know, concerts these days are crazy priced, right? Like, what's, what's, what was the era's tour? Like, thousands of dollars, Springsteen's hundreds, Working Man Hero, hundreds, thousands of dollars for his ticket. Now he's sick and he's not even playing them. So, what is a concert ticket you can get for only 45 cents, Jay? I'm not sure. All right. It is 50 cent with Nickelback. <laughs> that is... That is um... A classic and terrible dad joke. Absolutely love Perfect. it. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely love it. So, my man, you speak a lot about imposter syndrome, positivity of men. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a brief overview, sort of, of, of what you talk about? And then we'll kind of bring this all in for fathers. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about helping men specifically is, you know, if you help men, it's obviously going to trickle down not even trickle down. It's going to be like a tidal wave of positivity for their families, for their communities, their spouses, loved ones. And as a, a man who grew up, you know, in the eighties and nineties, emotions weren't something that was talked about like publicly, like especially for men. So for much of my life, I did not have the vocabulary to describe how I was feeling or the permission to even share that or explore it. So one of the reasons why, I'm so passionate about this work that I do is to give men that vocabulary and that space to explore who they are and specifically imposter syndrome, which it, it's a word that, that has been in the media a lot lately. And it's basically when you feel like a fake, despite like any like levels of accomplishment or accolades, degrees, awards, whatever it is, you feel like you're a fake and you're just BSing everybody and your life is like this house of cards that as soon as someone finds out, it's just going to collapse. And I didn't know that that was a thing. I just thought everyone didn't believe the good things people said about them until a friend of mine I was on a work trip with um, gave me that vocabulary almost 10 years ago. But for the first 35 years of my life, I didn't know what imposter syndrome was. I just thought that was the way everybody was. I think this is so related to what almost all fathers go through nowadays yeah. and that without, without the proper context, there's no dialogue. There's no vocabulary going to the hospital. Most, most children are born in a hospital, going to the hospital, feeling like a secondhand person in the room, not really even involved in delivery as, as most men are treated in that way. There's just a, a, a total lack of understanding and education around what it is to be a father and what what is that role and how you can support and contribute and what's here's the crazy statistic around this is that 51 percent of men this is a survey so 51 percent of men surveyed in this survey really do strongly attach a lot of positivity to the role of fatherhood they're actively engaged they want to be more involved they're taking on more of the direct parental duties that are traditionally uh run by the mom but this whole movement of feel good fatherhood, of fatherhood awareness, that kind of stuff, it is rife with imposter syndrome and fakeness and not fitting in. So I completely understand how that would be really imminently valuable to a feel good father. Yeah, absolutely. And what you touch on is indicative of just how the, the this kind of pol polarity that society and especially the entertainment industry portrays um, men as. You know, you're either you know, Hollywood portrays you either as like Rambo, you know, who can like bring down a Russian helicopter with a thumbtack and a rubber band. And you're the lone wolf, which, by the way, spoiler alert, that lone wolves in the wilderness die. So, you know, that's one way that that they tell us we should be. Or the other way, if you look at, you know, pop culture is fathers specifically and all men are just buffoons. Like, like we can't tie our shoe or get out the door if it weren't for you know the the woman playing opposite of them in the in the in the 
sitcom. I think when I think back to my start with, with men's health and, and kind of, especially in my, because we're around the same age around college and university that that whole King of Queens, everybody loves Raymond, uh, even Homer Simpson. Yeah. That these are just the messages that we've learned as men about what it, what is masculinity. And I think, okay, so now we've reached adulthood. Now we've been watching, um, all of these characters on screen. I, I kind of can't help, but point the finger and just be like, Hey, culturally, because media and art is an expression of culture, culturally, this is what we were telling everybody was masculinity. Right. And, um, I, I, I just, I see all the damage of it. People not being able to take seriously. There's a, there's a gentleman, I'm not sure if you're aware of him, Adam Lane Smith. He, uh, recently put out uh, as a tweet. So he's a family therapist, all that kind of stuff. He talks about men would, uh, if you really want to or like, oh my goodness, men, if you, uh, they never really hear that they're respected by their spouse. Mm -hmm. And he said like, Hey, if you like, imagine saying this and imagine the kind of result you would get from it. And the responses from women were crazy. Like, I remember, I remember reading, and this is all on Twitter. One of them was like, I could never bring myself to tell a man that I respect him. I just can't, I just don't. Um, one was like, yeah, I think I'm just going to go crawl under a rock. I'm never really going to do this. I think it's absolutely nuts. And what is it? Like, what is the respectable, respectable man? What is that person? What other roles that they take on? Let's kind of like hear your reaction on that piece. Yeah. Men that, that understand who they truly are authentically and what lights them up for their personality and, you know, through the, the lens of just their, their life experience, men who have a very good understanding of that and live their life in accordance with that serve the ones they love and their communities from a place of abundance. Because men that understand who they truly are know what's going to deplete them and what's going to increase their energy and they have the communication skills to communicate that to people where things go off the rails with the best intention are when you know men that don't have that understanding of who they truly are or have those communication skills to compassionately communicate with people in a respectful way but they still want to do good by the ones in their lives. They just start doing what they feel like they should be doing. Mm. Right. And when they do that, they, it eventually the tank runs dry. Right. If they're just doing things they should, they think they should be doing. And maybe they've never even asked anyone. They've just watched what someone does on a movie. And it's like, Oh, I guess that's what a good dad does. Good dad just goes to a job that they hate and, you know, to, to make money. And that's not sustainable. And that comes out in so many different ways negatively. You know, sometimes it comes out like sideways with like the little like, you know, well, I guess I'll just go do this, you know, so you all can be happy and kind of trudge off. Or, you know, it can also come in like a, a tidal wave. And that's where you get the, the blowout arguments that have maybe been building for years. And that's, you know, where the, the, you know, the, those two words that should, you know, not be said always and never like, I always do this and you never respect this. And I'm always, you know, so knowing who you truly are and what lights you up allows men to serve from a place of abundance and, and authenticity. I love this train of thought. It really kind of makes me want to ask the question about what do you see as the balance of the provider perfect protector role that I think a lot of men naturally fall into mm -hmm. and a lot of society, whether they're willing to admit it or not, are kind of leaning into versus certain sort of mod more modern expectations. Yeah. So, and just so we're, on, we're speaking to the same terms, when you say provider, do you mean like, like, like monetarily or just overall like providing for the family? And that's a blanket term. I think that the understood term of that is financial providing. 
having the job, bringing money into the house, having that, like having a house, putting groceries on the table. I think that's the general understanding of the provider yeah. role. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you, since I left corporate America in 2017, my wife has been the primary breadwinner of the house, you know, the, and, but for the first, you know, 12 years, 15 years of our relationship, I was the primary breadwinner. Um, so I started looking at like, okay, what are some ways that I can contribute while I was getting my photography business up and off the ground? And I was like, all right, well, maybe we don't need to be spending $400 a week on daycare for our three children. Mm. And I need to be more efficient with my time and how I structure things. And I'm not making an extra $2,000 a month yet, but I'm saving the family $2,000 because, you know, what is it? Time, talent, or treasure? What, what do you got? Well, my treasure went away. <laughs> my, 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 my income, you know, was significantly decreased, but I had a lot more time on my hands, or if nothing else, I was in charge of my time. more, So I was able to provide that way for my family. And then, you know, and then being able to pour into the, the kids you know, more than just on the way to daycare, you know, shoving a granola bar in the back seat, you know, in the minivan as we're trying to get them there, you know, before I had to be at work, actually being able to spend time with them and make them breakfast and have those conversations with them as soon as they get off the bus. That, you know, by the time I would have gotten home from work, you know, they're already on to the next like five things. So there's a lot of different ways I was able to restructure things, you know, to, to provide in a different way. I think the modern context that we're discussing is there is, I think, a general pressure that men feel to provide. I, I think that in the, in the moments in my life when I've been in between or building, that there's been a lot of self-pressure. Yeah. And I think that a lot of men feel this way. And I think, I think it's correct in some way yeah. that society and that the spouse does place that pressure, right? We don't want the deadbeat. We want the ambition, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm bringing up the ambition because even in your story, it wasn't like you were just out leaving work to play video games, do all that kind of stuff on the couch. Right. It was more, I'm building this next business. Can you man the store for a little bit from the primary provider role and do that? Right. And I think a really modern, healthy version of the spousal relationship is one where that can go back and forth. That's been true in my life with my wife and that we've gone back and forth for who has the higher number. Uh, but then in addition, she's also had the opportunity to take two years off when our first daughter was born and just mm -hmm. raise her from home, right? Just, and she, she had that need and that came up. And then lately, you know, for the past couple of years, I've had that for, for my, myself where I've been building and growing into sort of the current state, uh, especially for the brand strategy role that I have right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. We you Go ahead. Sorry. You mentioned protector, um, which, which I hadn't touched on yet. Um, and so my wife and I are both martial artists. We're both, we're both black belts. And one of the, one of the things that they just drill into us throughout all the years of training that we had done, and we earned our black belts as adults. It's not like we got them when we were like 13 and, you know, when you were still bendy and could do all the things. Like we started in our thirties and one of the biggest things that they teach us and it's one of the reasons for all the bowing and all the respect and all the courtesy is to give you that discipline to never have a physical altercation like like we are trained to avoid physical altercations at all costs so being able to model that for my kids is is paramount because they know you don't have to be the strongest person in the room to win a you know a, a conflict whatever that is there's a there's a huge strength in being able to sidestep it or see it coming and get yourself out of harm's way and then the other the other one the number three on that would be to actually de-escalate right and so um this is a a fantastic skill i had the exact same experience in my martial arts journey uh, which which martial arts by the way ishinru karate Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I did a keto. So, okay. uh, yeah, that was, that's awesome. Um, you, when we were talking off air, you mentioned that you had done a tremendous amount of personal de development and that this was a big piece of 
how you've turned this around and kind of in your current venture as a men's coach. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through your experience and let's, um, as we're doing through that, let's kind of tie it to how we're bringing it into the house and teaching our kids some of these principles and concepts. Yeah. So going, going back, um, you know, I, I had a lot of unprocessed trauma and it came out in the way of very low self-esteem, you know, throughout much of my life. And I mentioned I didn't have the, the verbiage to describe imposter syndrome, but even though like I was, I was a legit rocket scientist, like, like a lot of these things hanging behind me are like awards and letters of commendation that I got for, for those efforts, including like landing things on Mars. Like I was part of the landing, landing systems teams on um, that did the testing. So like we were out doing the things like I, I was an engineer, I had like hard data of like, I, I was able to operate at this elite level. And again, this is before I knew about imposter syndrome, but my level of self doubt and imposter syndrome was so bad that um, I was one of the leads on a Department of Defense project. Um, and we, we did such a good job. They, the military issued us civilians letters of commendation, which is a pretty, which is a big deal, like as a civilian. So they had a big ceremony at the company I worked at at the time. And I just remember right before they, they called my name and to, to issue me, you know, this letter of commendation. It's actually it's hanging. It's right there. Um, I just had this, like, I almost started crying and I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like, why am I almost crying? And it wasn't tears of joy. It was because I just had this core belief that the president of our company was going to be like, oh, oh, Melora? Yeah. No, this guy's actually been BSing us for years. Which, looking from the outside in, that, that's like a, a very illogical train of thought to have. Like, the thing like that I worked on was out doing what it was supposed to do in a hostile environment halfway across the world. But I still had this belief that I was not worthy of this. And that, that like self doubt would come out in different ways. Like I was always trying to prove I, basically to myself that I was good enough and worthy. So like I was always the first to raise my hand for the most difficult assignments, the most potentially hazardous assignments, the jobs that were going to send us away from home for, you know, the longest amount of time just just and i didn't realize this but it was it was to make myself feel worthy well mm -hmm. guess what would happen spoiler alert i would go to those jobs and be gone for like weeks at a time you know halfway around the world not being able to talk to my family i didn't feel better you know i, I would do these jobs that were potentially hazardous and i'm like sitting out in the middle of some field waiting for something to explode going what am i doing here um didn't feel better about myself and what also happened was I built up this Superman persona at work that, you know, I, I built up, I, I always call it like a veneer of perfection. Mm. And I always felt if, if anyone like challenged that, like in a meeting, like I would immediately like verbally like cut the legs out from under them. You know, I came to, came to realize it was my, you know, impressive ability to read people's emotions but i would use it like darth vader used the force like he was really skilled in the force right <laughs> but darth <laughs> vader used it for for you know for you know evil and that's how i would use this ability i had to read people if i felt threatened or if i felt my reputation was threatened like i would just cut the legs out from someone and like you know say something verbally to pierce them in the heart so like for lack of a better term like i, I was an a-hole showing up how did this manifest for your family like what happened in the house? Um, did did any of this get rubbed off on your kids? You know, so, so a lot of that that was that was pre kids. Um, now I had been married, um, and it, at that time in our lives, like I was traveling a tremendous amount for work. You know, I had like the Uber Diamond level at Hilton, you know, or Hampton, and whatever it was, because I was gone so much. My wife was like earning her masters and was in the very early part of her um teaching career she's a high school teacher she still is um god bless her <laughs> um, <laughs> so like our paths like never like w would would cross minimally you know because i just wasn't 
I wasn't around a lot. Um, but during that time in our life, like I, I can remember like, you know, we would have like arguments. They'd be like these big blowout arguments. And like, I couldn't even tell you what they were about, Jay. Like they were just like, <clears throat> and that was, that was just kind of how I showed up pretty much for all of my life, mm-hmm. you know, starting probably from like middle school on, um, two big things, you know, happened almost back to back that really gave me pause to realize like how I'm showing up in the world. And the first one was actually the birth of our first child in 2008. Mm -hmm. And one of my core fears that would like stir my anxiety up so bad was I was, I was always worried I was going to disappoint the people that I cared about or that were depending on me, you know, despite a track record of like, not like I always showed up and I always completed the the project or the mission, whatever we were doing. I just had this core belief that I was going to disappoint people. So when I became a father, I was like, Oh my God, like th- this, this child is like depending on me. And I remember my anxiety, like I had a straight up panic attack. The first time I was left alone with her, Jay, my wife like you know she 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 was home like from the time like we came back from the hospital we'd been home for a couple weeks and my wife's like i gotta get out of the house and i said yeah you look like you need to get some fresh air (laughs) so i don't know she like went to walmart or something and our daughter was asleep she was you know a, a very new newborn and my daughter woke up and you know there i had the bottle all ready to go and she wouldn't take it and she was just wailing. My wife's not home. Like my daughter needs something. I can't. I can't provide for. Her. And obviously, like you know, it, in the early stages of fatherhood, you're like obviously extremely sleep deprived, which doesn't help. You know, your mental right. health at all, right? And dude, I had a straight up panic attack. It was like that. That you know, that devil on my shoulder going like, "See, look, you can't even feed your own child." told you you were, you're gonna blow this and look now you're gonna affect this kid you're gonna pass on you know all this all this garbage that is between your your ears and like it it put me in like a very bad headspace which was amplified because everyone's like oh you just had a baby that's so awesome congratulations and meanwhile i'm like i am like falling apart but you know i i did what i always did i just kind of put on this mask and and just went went through the motions so that that really set me off on like a a very big downward spiral where my anxiety came back like really full force and then a few months after that happened um kind of like the the one two punch that like just sent me to rock bottom was i got a call on a like a really sunny friday um afternoon i was excited for the weekend and got a call from a a, a, a old friend from high school I'm like, I haven't heard from her in a while. And she was just sobbing and just said that one of our our best friends had just taken his own life. And he was not only like a a friend, but he was someone, he was a year ahead of me in school. So like I looked up to him. I don't have any siblings. So like he was almost like a big brother to me. You know, he graduated high school went right into the military, you know, was deployed all over the place. And like, I, I just like, idolized him and to hear that that he had ended his life like just sent me to like rock bottom like i couldn't i couldn't get my head wrapped around it like all my coping skills which were not healthy (laughs) surprise (laughs) didn't do anything to help and my my literal come to Jesus moment was a couple weeks after I found out he had died. I was getting ready for work and my wife and daughter were gone for the day. And I just remember standing in my bathroom like, I, what what am I going to do? Like I was in like a near state of like panic attack. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what what am I going to do? How am I going to go on living? Like, do, do I want to just stick around? Like, is this is this what I really want my life to be like? And for whatever reason, I said the serenity prayer. It it Mm -hmm. popped in my head, which up until that point, the reason why that's super pivotal of me saying the serenity prayer 
of you know giving the, the strength, courage, and wisdom is that after graduating Catholic high school, I wanted nothing to do with religion, and it's like I didn't. Even, it wasn't like I just quietly went about my way and like didn't go to church. Like if I found out someone was like, you know, religious, it didn't matter Christianity, Muslim, Judaism, whatever it was, I would straight up say to people like, "What are you not strong enough to do life on your own?" Like I. I had that like lone wolf mentality that I told you about is such BS. I, I totally had that. Meanwhile, and I'm like giving people a hard time and I'm like falling apart inside. Mm -hmm. So for me to say a prayer, like I was literally like at the end of my road, dude. And when I said that prayer, I just had this like warm sensation come over me from like head to toe. And I thought I've either just lost my mind for real or maybe god's real and that moment of just like brokenness and surrender was when like i allowed like jesus and the holy spirit to like come into my life mm -hmm. and one of the first things that became evident was how i was showing up like kind of like the mirror got turned on me and like i just had this like heart to like like how am i showing up in the world and i started thinking about things i'm like this is not good this is not how I want to be remembered and started just doing the work in, you know, in the summer of 2009 is when it started of like recognizing when I would get, and again, I didn't have this vocabulary when I would get triggered in a meeting and like lash out at someone verbally. And, you know, because my job, I was a test engineer. We, like our life was ruled by data. My mentor mm -hmm. Skip always used to say, you know, one good test is worth a thousand opinions. Like if you can get data on something, that that's where the truth is. So I started getting data on myself. Mm -hmm. and just what, started, did that, what did that data look like? So like what it was would be like, I'm like, all right, I'm lashing out at people. I don't I don't really have any true friends like like at work, like. I find myself like just always angry. So I, I started keeping track of like when I would like lash out at people or someone would say something and like it would just set me off. Like I had like such a hair trigger temperature or not temperature, temper. Um, Temperament, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like when I would like lash out, I would take stock of what happened and kind of, you know, back into that. And then... You know, and and this is like a this is like a very long process, and then work on correcting that behavior the next time, or at least minimizing it. Until so it's it sort of it's and it feels like it was the other side of like a gratitude journal, where in a gratitude journal you're writing down what you're grateful for in the morning, you're kind of reviewing what you did at the end of the day, like oh I'm really grateful for all these things that are happening. You were doing this. Where could I improve? What happened? What set me off? And yeah. you're, right, you're writing that down or having a thought about it and then doing the deep work, as we say, on those yeah. elements. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great way to describe it. Um, so, yeah. So I just started going through the, the that self-work and like with you know, I was just so determined to do better. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, now I had like a one year old at home mm. and I'm like, I have an opportunity to like actually correct things that like I that were never even known I needed correcting, you know, and it what wasn't something I had modeled for me. So um that that's where a lot of this desire to like bring things into like the space of discussion came from because that wasn't something that, that was ever modeled, you know, throughout throughout my life. If if you're a feel good father and you want to start this process, what would you say you know, three steps, what, what would you say they could do? What would be something that they could do to start analyzing or getting data on themselves? And then what would they do with that data? Yeah, self-awareness is so key. But, and, and be honest with yourself and recognize that if you're truly committed to this, to, to being a feel-good father and the best father that you can be, like you're probably not going to like the first few answers, right? It's like, it, like anytime you start something new, whether it's cooking or a sport or what, you know, a hobby, like you're not going to be good at first, right? <laughs> at it. And, but focus on the fact that you're not just going to make your life better and those who are surrounding you, including, you know, your, your kids, 
but like these are the kind of things that can have like positive generational ramifications mm-hmm. like to really like break that with the generational chain that's talked about so so be self-aware be committed and then be willing to apologize when when you inevitably make a mistake one of the things that we have in this house and i apologize for not looking at you feel good father i was finishing up a note was our one of our mottos is if you make a mess you clean it up Mm. so it's all about that integrity about that about that responsibility of um and that extends far more to just the physical right starts with the hey your your bedroom's a mess why don't we clean that up yeah or even for us like in more parent spaces like oh the the kitchen needs to be cleaned up let's let's clean that up we've made that mess uh, and it extends to relational and emotional things so if there's a blow up uh, tempers lost if there's a disagreement there's always a hey you know i i do this i did it to, to my daughter this morning it was just like hey you know this happened you know i really apologize for that these are my expectations and i was set off and so um you know i'm just really sorry about that but you know now we're on the same page kind of thing and she was like she's pretty great she's like okay thank you you know and yeah. we have this high level of accountability in the house and that's exactly what i wanted to create yeah so for you what are these big familial values that you want to instill and are they related to self awareness commitment and and um I'll say ownership or responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, Ownership's probably at the top of that. Um, And that, that starts with my wife and I, like whenever we make a mistake, like, just like you were saying, like, I'll, I'll go to the kids and be like, Hey, I'm sorry. I handled X situation this way. I, I know that that was wrong and I don't make excuses. I'll say, you know, I, I was having a tough day, but I, I, I still should not have done that. And I'm, mm. I'm truly sorry. Got it. Yeah. And you know, it, you know, it, it's, you know, shadow the leader, right? Like whatever, whatever's modeled for them, they're, they're going to, they're going to pay attention to. So, so that accountability and ownership of things is, you know, very paramount to us being considerate of others and polite like not cutting each other off at the dinner table. Like there's five of us around the dinner table, you know, in, in a dog trying to scrounge whatever falls on the ground. So sometimes it can be, <laughs> you know, a bit Barnum and Bailey like, but, but we really try to, when someone's talking, let them talk. And, you know, then we got to have the discussion of just because you're talking doesn't mean you get to talk for eight minutes. Mm. <laughs> so, um, you know, really teaching that respect to so to the point now where our youngest is ten. We're we we were at the table last night, and one of the the one of his sisters was telling a story, and there was a pause for I think a burp or something, and he started in, and like his sister like gave him the look. He's like, "I'm sorry, were you not done?" Mm. You know, and that's like those moments when it's like those hard decisions my wife and I make as a team and like that we've done throughout the years when it would have been easier years ago to just like, you know, set them down, you know, with a tablet in front of them or let them interrupt each other just because I didn't feel like correcting them because I had a headache because I was exhausted from whatever I did. Being like, Hey buddy, she was talking. It's not your turn yet. Are you almost done? Yeah. With your story. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the I love this consideration element. It uh, it sounded like he caught himself, but right. was that like a coaching moment, or and that was kind of the the creation of that? No, that so yesterday was like like kind of like the the uh, the graduation <laughs> of all okay. those coaching moments that we've had. He caught himself. He said, "I'm sorry, are you not done yet?" And she said, "No, I'm not." He's like, "Oh, oh I'm sorry. Go ahead." Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, such a great, such a great example of the result that you're talking about. Some uh, something else that you you bring up is sort of this positivity ripple mm. from uh, being a good man, being a good father. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the goals I always had um, when when we had children, especially with our first two being daughters, was I wanted to set the bar 
ridiculously high for anyone that comes into their life in a relationship. Um, because my wife and her father have a great relationship and it's like, once I kind of got my head straight, I'm like, wow, what a, what a compliment to me that my wife held me in the same levels, her father, who I also tremendously respect. So for my daughters, I wanted them to see how a relationship is supposed to be like mutual respect, communication between my wife and I. Um, and then from, for my son, I wanted to make sure he saw that men can be, you know, physically strong, you know, capable of profound skills to protect them, but still be tender and loving and, and walk that balance. I, I, I really think a lot about the Sermon on the Mound when Jesus says, the meek, right? The meek shall like, blessed are the meek for all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think it was Jordan Peterson that talked about the Greek word that he used and that it's not meek as in shy or diminutive or the, um, what negatively we would refer to as the feminine version of that word. Mm -hmm. What, what, what he meant by meek was this concept of you have the power to affect a person mm -hmm. in generally in a negative way and you keep the sword sheathed. I think that's the exact mm. language that, wow. that Peterson that's used. Good. That's good. Um, and so that's the, you have the authority, but you don't necessarily exert it. And right. we see plenty of examples of history of the opposite. Right. And, um, you know, I think uh, the US, the US gets a lot of, uh, criticism in uh, over in the world today, but when we go back in time to like World War One and World War Two, the U.S. for a lot of the time was being that meek of like I'm not going to get involved. They're they're selling arms and doing that kind of stuff, but a lot of it was like we're not going to get involved. We're not going to get involved. They're not going to get involved. Just like not turning the military power on on others, and I think that's sort of a, a lesson for the government and. I don't even know why we're talking about topical stuff, but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> it was that, that core example of Meek, I think is really great. And I was thinking, and I know feel good fathers were thinking the same thing of like, yeah, you're a black belt. You can pr you know, break a man with your thumb or a finger or pinky or whatever. Right? Yeah, right. So that whole, that whole element I think is uh, really, really amazing. Mutual respect, great relationship communication. Um, I like the, for, for men specifically that control and tenderness of the physicality. Mm -hmm. What other traits, aspects could a feel good father glean to um, better have a positive impact on those around him? Again, it, it really comes to, to self awareness, and, and and it can be you obviously start with the big things. You know, if you're if you're having your temper explode whenever you know they forget to put in an extra chick-fil-a sauce a chick-fil-a and you lose your mind like get a handle on that bro like sure be better and then once you get your handle on like whatever the big things are for you in particular like it comes down then into the minutiae like whenever my wife calls from the laundry room and says hey can you get me some more soap like are the kids seeing me like go oh, mm. like roll my eyes or they see me be like, yeah, hang on, honey. I'm in the middle of something. Can you wait a minute? Mm. You know, having that communication back and forth because, you know, she might not know. I might have my hands like in like a 10 pound watermelon trying to feed, you know, all the kids that are playing basketball at the house. Right. Um, but again, that, that, that so being self-aware of how you respond and how you react to things and then how you communicate to people instead of like, like this is one of the big things I teach, you know, to, in, in my men's program which is like which, which is a 12 week six pillar program and about halfway through we get into communication because mm. that's such a big part like there's two ways to handle my wife saying like hey can you can you bring me some more soap there's the you know roll your head and like just go, oh, you know and just like make a face to my kids like mom's so annoying like because then they pick up on that mm. you know that's not good it's not good for me to be like i'm busy right she doesn't know 
the positive right. way is to have that that composure and wanting to respect her and say, hey, I'm in the middle of something. Is this like super urgent? She's probably like, no. But she's like, yeah, I'm like holding the iron, you know, that like fell off the wall with one hand and the dog just threw up on my feet. Like, can you help me out? Then, you know, I'll put the watermelon down and go help. <laughs> Got um, it. So, but the same situation, but three very different reactions. Absolutely love it. John, thanks so much for sharing all this stuff. And you mentioned your yeah. program. If people want to get to know you a little bit more, connect with you in some way or engage with your program, where can they go? Yeah, johnmalora.com. That's J-O-H-N-M-O-L-L-U-R-A. And you'll be able to see you know, the men's coaching program I do, which is called Authentic Men of Action. You know, it's really to help men dial in on who they truly are, like we talked about at the beginning. Um, you know, I work with them over 12 weeks and really help them dial into who they are and then teach them skills to not only understand who they are, but then be able to communicate, you know, their wants, needs and desires in a positive way that still serves everybody. And then also the skills to take action on that. Mm. Absolutely yeah. love it. John Muller, everybody. Thanks, buddy. Hey, what is up, everybody? John Malora here. I hope you enjoyed the time that Jay and I spent together talking about all things imposter syndrome, being a positive male role model, having that positivity trickle down throughout your family and the generations to come. If you liked what you saw here, make sure to like and subscribe to Jay's podcast, The Feel Good Fatherhood Show, because he has tons of awesome people on, maybe even more awesome than me. I'm sure you can go out and find someone there, but you want to make sure that you get notified as soon as Jay has new episodes come out. Take it easy, everybody. Awesome. And thanks for, for bringing up the bell. If you click the bell, it'll be down there. But YouTube has decided that this spot right here, this is the next video. It's going to oh, be okay. one of mine, one of those great conversations. Hopefully it's a short of my man, John here. If not, <laughs> it's going to be great anyways. Thanks.